Hi everyone, so we're live. I'm going to add everybody to this call. So it is it is a music hack space, so expect a little bit of hacking around. So we have Darwin, Valeria, we have JJ, Mike, and Nick. It should uh, Okay, 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 Right, so, right, so welcome, 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 welcome everybody. everybody. Uh, this, uh, is this is the first, first online, online seminar. seminar. Uh, uh, we, we have uh, Darwin, Darwin Gross, Gross here, here uh, uh, no, on that side. side. And, and we, we have, have Rock 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 here, here. Uh, uh, JJ, JJ Barad Barad above 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 me. Me. Mike, Mike over, over here, here. and, and Valeria yeah, 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 over here. here. Um, so, so today, today we, we are, are welcoming, welcoming uh, uh, Max, 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 Max users, users to talk, talk about, about their experience, their experience with it. With it. And, and, and as, as a preamble to, to, uh, to, to this uh, uh, in-depth in dive, dive into, into the practices, the practices. Um, um, Darwin, Darwin uh, Gross is, is going to, um, um, to present some thoughts. Uh, Darwin, uh, Darwin, Darwin works at uh, uh, Cycling 774. Four. And, and uh, uh, we're very excited to have him and this. If you use... Max, Max you, you have seen, seen his name, name on many, many, many patches. patches. You may not have seen his face before. before. So, so uh, very, very pleased, pleased to have him. him. Um, um, I apologize, I apologize for, for all the Skype logos, logos appearing, appearing on, the on the live stream. stream. Hopefully, Hopefully uh, when, when, when we get screen share, share it's going to be easier. So, so um, um, we, we are, are doing, doing this on a regular basis. It's the first time and there's going to be some nice groups with the technical which I'm going to sort out. I hear I this huge feedback. feedback. Okay, okay. Let, 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 me, let me sort, sort that, that out. out. I, 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 think I think if everybody, everybody uh, on this Skype call, call can, can turn, turn their mic off, off that would be really helpful. helpful. Um, you can't. You can't okay, okay. I have, I have a lot of, lot of feedback, feedback saying, saying that. that uh, okay, we need to sort this all the feedback. feedback. Yes, yes. Ginger, Ginger, thank you so much for that. Is it, is it helping? helping? Um, okay, is that, is that better now? We, should, we have a lot of uh, sound coming from everybody. I'm just going to mute everyone for now. Um, and uh, today's the first one. We have another one next week. Next week, we are welcoming Jim Simmons. We're going to, to present his work on uh, creating music with, uh, with VR. Uh, the week after that, we have Felon Kane and uh, Milton Marmikidis. Mo uh, making music from data. The week after that, on the 23rd, we have Andre Cabal, who just released a Max for Life plugin called Granurize, which is fantastic. And on the 30th of April, we have uh, Rob Ramirez from the Cycling 74 team, who's leading the work on Jitter, who's going to come and talk. So we have like four, like four more talks planned for the rest of this month. Uh, all right, so it looks like the problem is solved for now. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton on to Darwin to uh, give us some more insight into uh, into what's happening in the Max world. Um, over to you, Darwin. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and have a chat. Uh, uh, thanks clearly to Jean Baptiste for putting this together for the Music Hack Space for making this happen and for Goldsmiths for kind of supporting the whole thing. Um, I just have to say, you know, given what's happened in the world just recently, I, I'm left with the phrase of like, 
so this is what the brave new world was supposed to be. Um, somehow I had in my mind, based on my reading of science fiction and everything, that I'd be wearing like a, si uh, a shiny little one-piece suit and I'd be eating nutrition sticks that would keep me like uh, in shape and looking good. And instead what I have is I have a constant uh, fear of what my world's leaders are doing while simultaneously living in a small area in my basement because I happen to be coughing a bit. Um, not really what I expected the future to look like. But the fact of the matter is, um, it really affects us. It affects us as a, as a community, as, as it affects everyone, but we have some kind of unique adventures to go through. I mean, um, as, as a software company with Cycling 74, I mean, we've got a lot of things that we are struggling with right now. I mean, we are very active in being involved in meetups and doing workshops and doing presentations. All that stuff is completely off the, off the table for us. Uh, we don't get a chance to go to trade shows, which is where we interact with a lot of our friends in the industry. But also, we don't get to go to things like Loop, which is where we learn a lot about what the world is, is like as well. And... Um, and really, probably the thing for us is that a, a significant portion of our user base and our impact on the world comes through through working with uh, with academic uh, groups and ac in academic environments. And the whole world has just like completely shifted for the academic world. I and mean, there's there's literally everybody finding struggling to find ways to uh, you know to work work from home, work at distance, work in a no contact way. And it's really put us on our heels in terms of being able to support our customers. But I think that there's even greater difficulties for, for um, all of y'all as, as artists. I mean, first of all, those people, as artists, we're all kind of continuous learners. And um, learners have a, a, a whole new way that they have to approach things. The idea of going to a class or even getting one-on-one uh, -on -one training from somebody in person is just not, not available. And so we're struggling to find technological ways to pull it off. But maybe more, even more drastic is the way that all of us as performers or as uh, presenters of artwork um, our world is shot. We're cut out of venues completely. There aren't there is no playing a live gig. There is no going and setting up an installation for public viewing because this is just kind of off the table again in terms of what's what's kind of what's kind of acceptable. Another and maybe more subtle point though too is that an area where I personally see some of the most fertile um, artistic opportunities coming from is in the world of collaboration and collaboration Collaboration is something that really works great when it's face-to-face -face and when it's interactive. And all of that stuff has also kind of gotten taken off the table because of um, kind of our new no-contact world. So the question is, how do we get back past some of this stuff? Well, I think that what we've seen is we've seen a lot of effort uh, put into coming up with ideas of virtual performance spaces and virtual uh, performance activities. I mean, whether uh, <laughs> I love the meme that was like, hey, if you happen to get a Facebook posting uh, on Bono doing a concert from his home, be careful, because it might be Bono doing a house concert, right? I mean, it's a, it's a funny joke, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people are taking the opportunity to virtualize at least some portion of their interaction with, with, um, with the public. Um, we're also seeing a lot you know, I, I'm seeing at least a lot of heightened interac interaction in social media channels, less about, you know, maybe complaining about this or that and more about saying, here's what's happening. Um, I've gotten turned on to more new uh, newsletters, new virtual zines, new virtual performances. I've gotten turned on to more of those things over the last two weeks than I had probably in the past two years because people are very actively promoting one another in that way. Um, we're also seeing a kind of an explosion in uh, virtualized training, whether it's people putting out courseware, people uh, uh, 
people who have written books now being, you know, kind of promoting them as being available. Um, people willing to do virtual one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning classes, stuff like that. Um, but but also, I and I think probably one of the most important things are communities like this, like the uh, the music hack space, which allow us to stay cohesive as a community, more so even than social media. Having connections with people that seem personal is something that's really hard when, in a lot of cases, you don't get a chance to get out of your house, let alone get to meet with other people. So I think that these are these are really important uh, ways to to move forward and, and interact with each other and, and keep our artistic lives really intact and, and um, engaged. So um, I I think we all know what we want to do and what we want to try and accomplish. I want to fill you in a little bit of some of the stuff that cycling is doing specifically to help uh, to help through these kind of more difficult times. First of all, we've uh, We've got a, a number of different uh, kind of promotional things going on uh, to really liberalize the licensing to help uh, schools that are having to move to remote teaching, providing them with off-site licensing so that people can do work at home, providing more liberal opportunities for students who either use Max for project work or for, or for their own teaching. Um, all of this stuff, we, we've really become a lot more liberal in that just in order to the changing environment that people find themselves in. Um, secondly, we've done through our social media ch channels, we're actually doing a lot more ourselves in terms of collecting and passing along details about performances, performance, virtual performance venues, teaching opportunities, those kinds of things, so that uh, people who follow our social media are uh, getting clued into what other people are sharing. Um, and uh, a part of a part of that, and a bigger part of that, is just some efforts that we've been doing to just kind of collect and uh, present, you know, uh, bodies of work that, that people can explore. I mean, we find ourselves, you know, with the option of either, you know, working on our art or watching The Tiger King on Netflix, right? Um, I would stay away from that show if I were you, frankly. And instead, um, we just posted a, a, a posting in our newsletter, which also becomes a, a, a forum article on our website. That's sort of like a collection of places to check out, um, teaching things to look at. Um, it's a great opportunity to find what where are some of the virtual spaces where Max users can go and uh, take a peek. So if you go to our website, uh, look under the articles uh, section, you'll find the very first one is a discussion about uh, basically what to do when you find yourself isolated. It, it gives a lot of uh, basis to touch in terms of getting out there and uh, and finding uh, finding things to kind of engage your max max hungry brain into, and then of course we also want to maintain our interaction with the community. And uh, again, thankfully we get the chance to do things like come and visit this um, this uh, presentation. You know, I continue. I have a I have a podcast where I talk to people. It's a really great way to have a kind of virtualized interaction with artists. Uh, through a different through a different means, um, you know we continue to produce our newsletter. We continue to produce uh, tutorials. All these things are really vital ways of us maintaining our connection to the community. And so, um, if you are out there and you see something that you, you like, let us know about it so we can do more of it. If there's something that you can't find, let us know and we'll see if we can pull it together. But we're trying to really stay closely engaged with the community. So um, with that, um, that's just kind of an overview of where we're at. I have to say that I probably, like everybody, is stunned at where we're at and what we're looking at. And um, at the same time, it, it maybe feels like this is an opportunity for us to be more mindful about how we approach our artistic work and also how we approach our interaction with the community of people whose work we love and whose work we want to learn from. So with that, I'm really anxious to hear what uh, all of today's presenters have to say. 
I'm a lot more interested in, in that than in talking anymore. So um, with that, I'm going to get out of the way and let them get started. I want to thank you for letting, uh, letting me have a chance to chat. And so now I'll turn it over to uh, Valeria Rechenko. We will be able to hear in a second, just uh, Is my screen visible? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, hi. Um, my name's Valeria. Um, I'm a multi multidisciplinary artist. I recently graduated from Goldsmiths. I studied computational art. And um, I wanted to talk about a performance I did. It was my final master's piece um, called Sedalia. And that's what you can see on the screen now. Um, before I talk about that, um, just to kind of introduce my practice a bit. Um, I basically got started with Max when I was studying computational art. And I was focused on finding ways to use Max within my existing practice to take it further. Um, a big part of my practice is uh, based on my voice um, and I started to develop a process to kind of get into this headspace where I could then produce work um, and it was basically like me improvising vocally, recording that, playing it back, improvising on top um, and then that opened up and developed into a more uh, collaborative practice I started doing workshops where people would explore sound making processes um, like using your body and what it felt like to do that as a collective. And then all of that knowledge kind of um, fed into what I'm doing now. Um, and yeah, uh, when I started studying at Goldsmiths, I started to bring in the digital into that process, basically. Um, I was interested in the power of combining uh, digital sound with human sound to produce um, trance states and altered states of consciousness and, and connection. So I began singing with sine waves um, because I feel like they really support the voice, but also because they highlight any kind of irregular irregularities that might uh, come up. So if you're singing a specific frequency and you start to kind of oscillate, you'll hear that and you'll feel it in your body. And I found that um, very interesting. And so I... Um, that became the beginning of creating the soundtrack for this performance. Um, it's called Sedalia. It's an immersive performance exploring a post-apocalyptic narrative with a three, three screen projection and live singing. And it's kind of somewhere between music and art. Um, and I was interested in creating like a space and a kind of nameless feeling with the combination of my performance, the visuals and the sound. So I'm gonna show you some parts of it. Um, uh, I'll kind of talk you through. Can you hear that?
So this first part is um, kind of meant to be like a trance-inducing soundtrack consisting of sine waves and vocals. Um, part of the patch is like a vocal patch and, um, and then I'm improvising live. And I don't know if you can hear it here quite yet, but um, the sound was based on a lot of beating patterns. And I also used a 22 uh, equal temperament system uh, as opposed to the 11, uh, sorry, 12. <laughs> um, and I play the patch and improvise vocally and there are these like patterns around me. And then there's a transition and I start to sing um, like a song. And then that introduces the narrative part of the performance after which the sound and visuals switch to more of like a music video. Um, and the visuals and the sound are heavily synchronized. Like the, some of the video will, will jump between the different screens to the beat. Um, And it's basically an electronic music uh, composition. Um, I made some of the sounds in Max, but it's all kind of brought together in Ableton. And then I start to kind of sing another song um, to finish the performance. And um, yeah, I kind of segmented it into these two sections because I wanted people to, for them to really kind of embody the story and go on this journey, I felt like it was necessary to include something that would teleport them to that place. Um, and also because it's part of my practice, like that kind of trance, trance soundtrack is what I use to get into a state where I can create work like this so I just felt like it was um it just worked and in the space as well like there was there was a surround sound setup and um the beating patterns just like they just sound so different in that kind of space like they really feel like this uh you really feel it in your body so now I'm going to talk a bit about the actual patch behind it so here it is um this is just the this is the presentation mode. Um, I don't know, like, I haven't really seen that many patches by other artists, so I don't know if this is, like, messy or or not for you guys, but um, I wanted to keep it real. <laughs> this is uh, sort of what I used to play, and then if you exit presentation mode, it's a bit more chaotic. One second. Starting to lag a bit. So, um, this patch, uh, I think, is it's not really doing anything too, too complicated. It's a lot of simple things put together, and that's kind of what the whole performance was in general. Um, so the patch controls the visuals. I just like like would choose between the first and the second video. Um, and then I have this section here is the, is the beating patterns. I'll go through it and like play it a bit more in a second. And then I just have like different melodies and parts that come in. Um, there is also a vocal patch, but um, so I don't know if you can see clearly, but something that I, I guess I do quite a lot is I'll have this kind of main structure that then repeats on different levels. So I kind of use the structure of like a clocker object and a select um, all throughout the patch in different ways. So this this one is kind of like on the macro level, 
this is controlling the composition of all of these other sections. Um, and I kind of use it to keep time as well, just to, because I was, I was limited to 10 minutes. So um, it's kind of a useful way to do that. But essentially, yeah, I use a clock that does something uh, at different given intervals. So like, uh, for example, below here, I use it to like create this random melody and um, so yeah it's the same kind of structure clock or object a select object and then uh, there's a random so what happens is it spits out a number that's different every time sometimes it's not sometimes it's the same and it will create this like sound let me just turn it on One second. It might be a bit quiet. So it, it makes, it chooses a different um, hertz value every time to create a kind of semi random melody that um, listening to it like this. Not, not the most interesting thing in the world, <laughs> but in combination with everything else, it just added this extra layer of sound for me to um, improvise with live. Um, <clears throat> I also used it, uh, like I said, in this vocal kind of patch, um, and it was controlling different samples of me singing. Um, and then I think the most one of the most interesting ways that I used it here is uh, to create these beating patterns by using probability tables, and I'd kind of draw in a pattern. Um, I just feel like it's a really nice kind of interface to use um, because you can draw, you can just like draw a shape and you can change it live. But these are ones that I've kind of stuck with because um, I think they sound good together. So um, yeah, it might look a bit chaotic. Let me just explain. Sorry. Um, oh, things getting in my way. So. Um, Basically, beating patterns occur when you have a fundamental frequency and then one that oscillates or one that goes slightly above or below it. And you start to hear these rhythms. The lower the difference between the two frequencies, the slower that rhythm is and the higher, the faster it is until it eventually becomes a harmonic um, or like a melodic kind of quality. So. If you can hear that, you should hear this very slow kind of zooming sound. And then when I turn this on, you can hear it beat faster and then start to get slower. So what's happening here is um, on the x-axis is like the number that is coming here, like the second, every second. And then uh, the y-axis is what becomes the difference between the fundamental frequency and then this one that oscillates. Um, and, and I used several of these. I have one that's like the one that you're hearing now, one that's a slightly higher frequency, and then like a sub, which I don't know if you'll be able to hear. Mixing these live, like bringing them in. And like, like I said, in the space, it I think it sounds incredible, like having all of these different rhythms coming in and out, especially with the combination of the voice. Um, And then the vocals come in.
And then one more thing I wanted to briefly talk about that I think was quite interesting is that um, my uh, my computer is quite slow, so I couldn't with this setup that we had. Um, we find a good. Uh, like we had another computer in this room on the on the other side. So essentially, um, Clea, I decided to play the video from this computer in the room, and I would send a message from my laptop using OSC to another patch open on the um, was connected to like Mad Mapper. This software would receive the video that we would send through Max, and it would project it across these three um, screens. And um, yeah, I just had like a small issue where um, my so when I would when I would press wait, let me show you. Sorry, <laughs> here um, to trigger like like video one or video two, and it would be sent through through OSC to this other patch but um, there was a kind of there was a delay between when I pressed the button and and then when the video would actually show up on the screen so I used the same structure that I showed before um, to kind of create a one second delay I think it might have been slightly different to account for that lag and then that would trigger the song to play from my computer and I would like bring it in um, so uh, and that way, the video and the sound were synchronized because, um, as I said, they were like it was important to work together. Um, um, so yeah, so in that sense, I think um, like Max as a tool for content management can be really useful and simple. Like I think if you are doing performances. Um, Sometimes you end up, if you're using sound, sometimes you end up trying to, uh, what's the word? Like you, you create a preset composition that you then have to like rigidly follow so that everything stays in time. But it's a lot easier if you have that power to just in the moment change things. And I think you don't need to have a very extensive knowledge of Max to be able to do that. Like here, uh, um, I'm just, you know, playing videos and, and playing a song uh, this the, the rest of the patch is maybe a, a bit more uh, complex, but yeah, um, I just think that's quite a powerful thing. That's everything I wanted to say. Um, yep, that's it. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Valeria. So uh, our next speaker is, yeah, it's your turn, JJ. So I'm going to pass on the baton to you. Um, let's make sure that if you can stop. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, it's, it's your turn, JJ. So apologies for this. Uh, let's try to share your screen now. Okay, can you see it? Uh, not just yet. Um, just a second. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. You see it? Yep. Cool. So, hi everyone. Uh, and thanks uh, Jay Bay for, for doing this and for having me in this, this first uh, online meeting. It's very cool. And so my name is JJ. I'm an independent researcher and developer here in Paris. And so today uh, I want to talk to you about a Max for Life device that I uh, have built that is called Factor Mini. And so actually it's uh, a pair of devices that are um, 
that I released uh, about one year and a half ago. Uh, so Factor Mini, it's the uh, the lightweight version of Factor Synth, uh, which are two devices that um, make use of uh, some unsupervised machine learning uh, methods to um, so specifically, uh, they, they, they use matrix factorization. It's an algorithm called matrix factorization. And so they are based on decomposing sounds, right? So you can input any uh, type of sound, uh, in uh, this case, sorry, JJ, uh, any I'm, kind I'm of clip. Sorry, JJ, I'm interrupting for a second. But uh, you're yeah. currently sharing this sure. call uh, instead of your screen. I'm sorry for that, yes. And now you should see yes, all good. Ableton. Okay, sorry. Yes. So um, these uh, these two devices, as I was saying, um, they use this matrix factorization thing. Uh, I will show you what it does in a minute. So actually, this device factor mini. I just before the meetup, I posted. Um, a link to the forum, to the Music Hacks Play forum, uh, when, where you can download uh, Factor Mini if you want to take a look into the patch, which I will go into uh, in a minute. So, um, well, I think the best is to show you uh, what it does here uh, on Ableton Live. So, here you can see Factor Mini is already sitting in, um, in an effect area. And then I go ahead and open the main interface which uh, for the time being is completely empty, right? So I have this uh, drum loop sitting here that, that you can listen now, hopefully. Can you hear that? Okay. So um, what you can do is select this clip, for example, and then and then uh, you have to turn the device on, of course. You select it, and then uh, you click on factorize. So factorize means that it's performing this matrix factorization. It's a kind of uh, unsupervised uh, learning uh, thing. And what it produces here is a set of uh, shapes that you see here, okay? So you see over here on the top, you see spectral shapes. Those, so these are spectra that are contained in the sound, right? So this would correspond this area to low frequencies. These are the high frequencies, and you should see it this way, like, and in this case, it's a drum loop, so the spectra are pretty noisy. As you can see, you do not see any harmonic structures. And here on the bottom left, you see uh, a set of temporal shapes. So the temporal shapes tell you which of the spectra are active at any given time, right? So, and they are sorted in such a way that the first uh, temporal shape corresponds to the first temporal, uh, sorry, the first spectral shape, and the second temporal shape corresponds to the second, and so on. So, uh, that's the analysis part. So, for the moment, you don't have any output yet. Uh, this, this area here is going to display the output waveform. So, in order to get a uh, sound output, what you have to do is connect um, any pair of temporal and spectral shapes. For example, if I go ahead and connect by clicking on this uh, switchboard here, if I connect this, this first temporal shape with the first spectral shape, I would get a sound uh, that corresponds mostly to the hi-hat of the loop, okay? And then... Let me see, so I can connect this one here. So now, maybe these three together. These three together are now playing their corresponding uh, spectral shapes. And in this case, right? So you can do kind of a simple separation like this. So you remove elements from the drum loop. Uh, and the elements in the, on the diagonal here are the original elements. So if you select all the diagonal, the full diagonal here, you are just reproducing the original sound. But you can remove elements, you can uh, remix them, like you can set a, a different volume for the hi-hat here. And then, uh, this is not only uh, something to do with simple source separation, like 
this, but it's also like uh, more a sound design tool. So uh, the more interesting stuff happens, uh, I mean, at least from the from the creative point of view, is when you start assigning components out of the diagonal. Like, for example, you uh, tell the temporal shape of the uh, drum, uh, of the kick drum, drive uh, a spectra that is originally not related to it, right? So you can randomize uh, the sound in many ways. Okay, so this is this is the idea. And uh, today, since we have an audience uh, that is Max users, uh, my what I wanted to do is open the the patch and show you and discuss a couple of the. Um, let's say implementation challenges that I had to face uh, while while doing this and well uh, share about uh, my experience right so um, before I open the patch I prepared here a small um, overview of the architecture of both factor synth and factor mini so factor mini uh, as I told you, is a is a reduced version, um, but the um, the architecture and the engine is exactly the same. It just has a bit less uh, features. So here is where the whole processing happens. Right? So this is an external object, factor synth tilde, uh, where the whole the composition happens. So the matrix factorization and also the whole uh, resynthesis. So all this is coded in the in the C language and compiled as a, as an external object into the patch, right? Um, so and today uh, I will I will mostly discuss how this object interacts with the other parts of the patch and with Ableton Live, right? So I will talk about two specific parts. So the first one is uh, how I um, deal with the display because the main uh, difficulty of the display, the main challenge was that the display is dynamic and what I mean with that is that you can change the number of components for example by default it factorizes into eight components here so eight spectral shapes and eight temporal shapes but you can tell it to factor STS into three components, for example. And so you see that the interface uh, is changed. There are some objects here that have disappeared, and there's this matrix that has uh, been resized. So let me go ahead and and open the, uh, the, uh, the patch in Max. By the way, I think if you have questions, you can type it on the YouTube chat. And then afterwards, um, uh, Jean Baptiste can uh, can relay them to me if I understood that correctly. So let's see. So let's unfreeze the device. Okay, I will remove this connection in order for the window in order to to be um, resizable. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is the main interface. And the the whole interface is here coded as a bit patcher. Let me go ahead and factorize it again so that we can see the the uh, functions here. Okay, there you go. So I entered into edit mode. And so uh, um, I open this bit patcher, and you see just the uh, display elements. So they are actually, these ones here are multi-sliders and this is a matrix controller in Max, right? So this thing is controlled by, uh, so this is the main patch, is controlled by a JavaScript. Okay, so the whole uh, positioning of the elements, the colors, the, uh, the sizes and the number of the elements in, is controlled by this uh, JavaScript object. And so at the beginning, I thought the most natural thing was to just create and delete uh, the multi-sliders uh, on the fly uh, and also the dialogue one, right? Uh, so, but very 
soon I started uh, running into all sorts of uh, trouble with the parameters of them, because, for example, every uh, temporal shape here is associated with a dial, and the dial is associated with a parameter that can be automatized in Ableton Live, right? So if you go here uh, uh, to Live, you have all these parameters in uh, factor mini that you can assign a curve to, or you can you can uh, also control with a with a MIDI controller. And so, for example, here this the last ones here is these temporal gains. They correspond to the dials. And so, if I was deleting and adding objects, uh, it was causing a lot of trouble here in Ableton Live. So instead of that. I ended up creating all the objects, so all the objects I present, but they are hidden, right? So here, sliders, only the the first three ones are active right now because I just factorized with three components. And but everything is present. So instead of creating and deleting, I ended up. I will do this a bit a bit bigger. No, actually, you can you can do the font. Sorry for that, but uh, uh, so um, yeah, somewhere when I when I um, change the number of components, there is a hidden setting that I turn uh, on and off, right? I think it's over here, right? So at this, uh, for example, this is for a for a um, um, temporal shape. I set hidden to zero, and then it appears at that point. And in that in that way, um, I can uh, really uh, fix the number of parameters. Of course, the drawback is that in uh, in live, you will always see the whole list of parameters, even the ones that are not used, you know, the components that are not used. So that's the small uh, drawback of this of this trick. Uh, in factor mini, it's okay because you only have eight components. In factor since you can have up to Thirty. So the list of parameters in Ableton Live is really huge, but well, I think it was worth it uh, in order to avoid all the parameter uh, problems. And I think I got uh, one question here uh, on the chat. Okay. Yes. So you, uh, so you are asking. Someone's asking about this uh, unsupervised machine learning uh, algorithm that I used. So. Um, this is actually a type of machine learning algorithm. Unsupervised means that uh, you don't need um, a labeled database uh, in order for it to learn, right? So you just put any kind of data, and by itself it will it will extract some patterns, but you cannot really uh, know what kind of patterns it's going to extract. Uh, it's going to extract some interesting patterns according to, to some criteria. So the algorithm here is called NMF. It's non-negative uh, uh, matrix factorization, and it's supposed to uh, extract patterns that have some uh, a condition called sparsity. So the, each of the pattern is kind of separated from from the other. That's why it works very well with source separation. So it's machine learning in in the sense that it extracts patterns by by itself, but it's not the kind of machine learning like neural networks that keeps uh, learning for a long time or it keeps improving over time. No, it's just observing a fixed set of data. The database is very small. In this case, it's just every every sample, so the whole frames of each sample, and it's extracting the patterns. That's the that's the kind of machine learning it, it, it does. All right, so let me go back to, to the patch here. Um, actually, let me show you again the, the architecture because uh, well, this I didn't mention when I showed the interface, but um, there wasn't any. I don't know if you, if you noticed, so there wasn't any uh, connections, direct connections between the uh, the factor synth object and the um, and the multi sliders. So it was much more convenient for me to use the Max API, and you know it's possible instead of sending through a connection or through a send receive object. It's possible just to code it 
inside the C code and use uh, a module in the Max API that you can send any message to to objects. Much in the same way that you can that you can do it with JavaScript, but everything is controlled by this object. So it's it's much more convenient in this case where you have so many um, lists and multi sliders. Okay, and the second thing I wanted to to discuss was this left part here on the of the architecture. Uh, which is how I synchronize with Ableton Live, right? So, actually, this is the thing that uh, I had to spend most uh, time doing, because uh, factors in the, and factor mini they are not um, real time audio plugins. They are not effects where you get a real time signal in, you process it, and then you get a real-time signal out. Um, it's And it's not a MIDI instrument either, because you, you are not um, you are not launching uh, samples with a keyboard. So it's more of a clip, you, you can understand it as a clip editing device. And one key aspect of this magic factorization thing is that the algorithm has to observe the whole clip before analyzing. So it cannot really work in real time. It, it just has to observe the whole signal. And so it's more of a clip editing device. And so unfortunately, um, there is no way. Uh, so the, the, the live API, so the LOM, it's called the LOM, the live object model, uh, it doesn't allow to read or write samples from clips, okay? That's uh, unfortunately, but that's not possible. So I had to think about many ways how to circumvent that, uh, how to go around that. And uh, for this version of Factor Mini, I ended up doing this thing. Um, so first of all, when I select, when you select the clip here on Ableton, uh, first I load the samples into a buffer in Max. And this part was actually not uh, very difficult because there is a component on the, on the LOM, on the live object model, where you can uh, grab the audio file not the clip directly, but the audio file that is associated with the clip, and you can load that into a buffer. And then, uh, again, there is no signal connections between factor synth and the rest, uh, because everything happens at the level of the clip, so the whole memory of the buffer is loaded into factor synth, the whole block of memory, again, with the max API. There is a, there is a set of functions to, to work with buffers, uh, like remotely, if you want, um, with, uh, without any connections. That part was okay. The part was really tricky was how to synchronize the output because Factors in does it, its thing, it processes, and then it writes the output to a buffer. And this buffer here has to be synchronized uh, with life. So at first I wanted to do, uh, to give the impression that the clip is being edited. So the workflow is like, okay, I wanted to make Factor Mini and Factor Synth uh, playback at the same time that the original than the original clip would play in Ableton Live, right? And so for that, I had to read a, a lot of temporal information from the uh, from the clip and pass it to the play object that is going going to play the buffer. Okay, and now I'm going to show you. Um, a couple of interesting things that are related to that on the patch. Uh, let me go to the main sub patch here. And I will make it bigger for you because that's a bit messy and maybe you don't see it very well on YouTube. And now I cannot scroll because I have to activate the scroll slider. Sorry for that. So let me show the vertical and horizontal scroll sliders, and now I should be able to scroll, yes. Okay, so this is how it looks in real life. Um, and here is the object, the main object, external factor synth. Uh, and as I told you, you don't see any signal connections. 
it's just passing messages and banks and um, and the whole communication, for example, between the input buffer here is through the API. And also with the output buffers that are over here. And then the whole uh, timing information that I read from live uh, is inside this sub -patcher here that is reading a bunch of uh, properties doing some um, calculations and sending the, 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 the right message at the right time to the play objects. So uh, I invite you to look into this sub patch. If you if you download the patch and you look into that, you can look look into it. Uh, it's it's a mess. It's very complicated. Um, so, but if you are curious, you can you can take a look. I don't want to spend much detail about that because. Um, it's maybe not not that uh, interesting, but uh, the the thing that I wanted to to discuss is the how I handled the output audio here, because as you can see, there are actually two buffers, two output buffers here, and so there is some setup operations here, but there are two buffers that are associated with two uh, play objects here. And the reason is that um, every time you change something on the on the patch, on the on the device, every time you you change uh, a component, you activate a component, or you generate a random connection, or you even when you change the amplitude of the dials, sorry. Uh, then what happens is that Factorsynth uh, recalculates the output, actually the whole uh, clip, the whole buffer, and it overrides through the API one of the output buffers. Now, of course, you can do these changes while the device is playing. And so if you're playing a buffer and you change it in memory, uh, its content at the same time, so uh, all sorts of nasty things can happen. So mostly huge clicks and huge noises so uh, it's not a very good idea to do that and so what happens is actually that these two buffers are playing at the same time all the time but only one of them is directed to the output at any given time okay so for example while this buffer is playing and you do a change in, in factor mini for example, you create a new component connection, then that change is written to the to the other buffer, the one that is not playing at this moment, right? And when Factorsynth is done uh, writing to that buffer, it sends out a bang here uh, that is gonna you go sorry this one you go here is gonna launch a crossfade right between the buffer that was just playing and the new one that has just been overwritten right so it's launching here a crossfade uh, of uh, 40 milliseconds that's what happens for factor synth writes alternatively to buffer one buffer two and at the end of the of each writing it's sending a bang it's launching a crossfade and uh, it's going to send the right uh, output buffer to the output so that's why i uh, uh, that's how I avoid the uh, uh, these kind of clicks. Um, maybe I can just show you just uh, this is the last thing that I wanted to show you and then I will address a couple of questions that are coming in. Uh, so let me select the components and then you should hear well, actually, you don't have to hear the, the, this, uh, this drum loop again. It's just to show you that there is some output now. And so if I go ahead and erase, so this button here means that I erase all the components, so there is no output. Uh, I go back here in editing, in patching mode, and you see that's, that there is no output on the waveform. Um, but there still should be output in the buffer that has just been 
uh, playing, right? So, of course, I have to click on play. Sorry for that, let's go back to live. So, now it's playing. The output is uh, empty. But you see there is some signal going on out of the other buffer. Uh, so, if I force like the, the fade here again, you will hear because it's still there. Um, and then if I keep doing operations, it will jump between both both buffers. So that, that's the idea. That's the trick for the for the audio output. Um, well, that's the two uh, details that I wanted to discuss uh, during this meeting. And uh, as I told you, um, feel free to drop any question also by email later. And now I will go ahead and look at the couple of questions that are just came in. All right. So are there some sounds that produce more interesting output than others? Huh. OK, that's a good one. Um, yes, of course. But it's a bit unpredictable, I would say. Um, I can say in general that it works. I mean, if you. You can use this in two ways, right? You can uh, use this from the mindset of source separation. You can separate uh, individual elements. Now, don't expect it to do a complicated source separation like removing a voice, a singing voice, or an instrument from a mix. Uh, it's not for that. It's for extracting um, some elements that usually are short or repetitive but you cannot really uh, say what kind of elements you are expecting. So it's more of a trial and error. I, have, I can say that it works pretty well with drums, with drum loops like the one I showed, uh, because a drum loop is relatively easy in the sense that not many things are overlapping in time and that you have mostly, I don't know, six, seven, eight uh, different timbral, timbral elements. So with drum loop, it works pretty well uh, if you are using that from the mindset of source separation, you want to remove uh, elements, you want to add ones, you want to remix them. Uh, but then, of course, in general, you can just use it for a sound design or to randomize any any sound. And then, if you put a complicated mix, I mean, uh, many things can happen. Uh, usually, you, things that are especially noisy, they are picked up. As I was telling, repetitive things like you have, I don't know, like uh, a piano note playing um, uh, several times, it will be able to pick that to pick that up, and it can create pretty nice textures like from from um, with complicated mixes. Maybe with complicated mixes, the most thing that you can do in the sense of source separation is removing the drums or part of the drums. Uh, but but that's it. It's when you use things that are more complicated than a drum loop, or a sequence of notes, which is uh, works pretty well as well. It's more about uh, sound design and experimenting with randomization. Okay, so that was the first question, and the other one: uh, How is the factor synth object written in C? Yes, it's in pure C, and it was actually. Actually, with Max itself, no, not actually. So I, the code behind the analysis and the recent is it is older than the Max application itself. So uh, a couple of years before, I decided to to release that as a Max um, Max for Life uh, device. Uh, it was a command line application. So the the algorithm is was already implemented and it was uh, pure C. And actually, the command line is still available on my website if you want to check it check it out. So I did it um, also um, for people that I knew at IRCAM where I where I used to work uh, some years ago. And so at the beginning, it was a project for um, composers at uh, IRCAM that wanted to experiment with this um, matrix factorization thing. And I, I, as a demonstration, I did the, the code in pure C, and they were able to use this uh, command line application for doing a couple of works and also for doing specialization stuff. Um, so it was pretty experimental. 
uh, at that time. Then I had the idea to turn it into a Maxwell Live device. And of course, I could recycle the whole uh, C code. I, have, I had to change many things. But uh, I did it uh, before uh, I ported it into Max. I did it with Xcode. Um, and then and it was uh, really a matter of recompiling it into an object. So it was done before before Max and outside Max, yes. Okay, so I think that's about it from my part. Uh, again, um, feel free to drop me a line uh, to visit my webpage. Um, stay tuned, I'm going to release a version 2 pretty soon in which I will solve, you know, I will simplify this workload I was talking about with the synchronization. Uh, and uh, well, that's it for me. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, JJ. So we're going to move on and welcome Mike. So bear with us while we <coughs> transition to his screen. Here we go. Now we just need to wait for the screen share. to work, Mike. Yeah, let's see if this. Aha, uh -huh. maybe I was muted. Okay, so I can ramble on forever. Um, I hope you see a Max patch somewhere. I'm attempting to share my screen, but I have a bunch of uh, bracketing comments and I'll, I'll try to actually keep this to 15 minutes if I can. Um, one is um, thanks to Darwin and I'm in a similar boat. I, I am co-convener of a electronic music computing and technology program at Goldsmiths. So just figuring out how to teach and stream and deal with all of this stuff has been um, uh, a high level problem for me at the moment. Um, I was gonna talk about that today. Um, and that's, I would say this is bracketed by, for some reason I decided Windows was the way to go this year. So I changed operating systems after a couple of decades. Um, I put some links in the forum about about that. I, I was hoping to present myself as a streaming ninja, but um, I think JB is, is way ahead of me here. But um, there are a bunch of tools and, and this, yeah, this reality of, of streaming is very interesting. And I'm, I'm simultaneously confused and excited by it. I'm the fact, the fact that this could be, you know, we have maybe a hundred viewers or so here is, is kind of nice. And actually I've gotten to see it to see because they're suddenly streaming. Um, so that's that's been my public facing persona, thinking about how to um, how to present yourself as a musician in in a time of crisis like this. Um, I guess the other bookend I'll put on Darwin's presentation is that um, I think we're really important. Uh, the more people I talk to online, the more um, you know. Uh, I, I'm happy to say most of my friends, most of the people I know, they can they can eat, they can get out. But um, this social thing, this cultural thing, this artistic thing, um, it's in times of crisis that I remember that artists are really genuinely important, and we're we're here to help our fellow humans through this world, and and we do it all the time. But um, so I so I'm, I'm I I feel like we all have an opportunity. To help out, and I'm glad, you know, I'm glad when we're doing it. Um, on the other side, all right. So I'm sharing. I'll share this. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. So here's a, here's a Max patch. So this one is way way less polished than previous Max patches. Um, so what I've done is actually um, in time of quarantine, I've, I'm diving back into some work I did. Um, a couple of years ago. 
So I, I, I was lucky. This is how I met JB. Actually, I, I came to London as part of a project called Rapid Mix, which was trying to make machine learning tools available to everybody. Um, and and the, the ambition, I, I, it was summarized to me very quickly, which was make something called Wekinator work in your browser. Um, and if you haven't heard of Wekinator, I'll post some links in the forum after. Um, my, my colleague, Rebecca um, Fiebrink, wrote this great software called Wekinator that takes OSC messages in and OSC messages out. And you can do all kinds of nice machine learning, supervised machine learning, which is kind of a contrast to the previous show um, in, in, in that app. And so I, I was tasked with writing it in C++ and writing it in JavaScript. And in fact, it's ultimately ended up as a Max object. So that Max object, it got to a point kind of typical of academic projects where it's pretty good. It works for the projects we do in house, but it has no documentation and it's a little messy. So I realized that what I should do in my next month is really get this thing together. So let me just show you for a second. Um, so I have my, my rapid max object here sitting around, um, but um, I'm starting with nothing. So the idea of supervised machine learning is this, that you say, when I get this, I want that. When I get this, I want that. When I, so you teach it by example. So um, usually I do this with um, live video streams. I've done this in, in demos before, and then I realized that I was going to be a total disaster here. So I have a, I have a recording of me in a slightly different room. But so here's me doing a couple things. I'm, I'm in a video, um, now I'm gone, and I'm gonna make a gesture. So let's let's say I wanted to I wanted to recognize those. I'm gonna make a really quick and dirty video classifier. So um, here's me here's me in the video, right? So that bit I'm gonna call um, I'm gonna call class one. And what I'm gonna do is play a little bit of this into my thing and record for a second. And I'm done. So what I've done is said. So what I've done is this. I have either live video stream. It was going well with. Just pretend it's Qt grab, um, Jit grab, and um, I'm decimating this video stream down to next to nothing, converting it to black and white, and just pumping these matrices of pixels into my machine learning algorithm. So my class one. That actually looks like class two. Let me try that again. My class one is going to be a bunch of pixel sets, 16 by 12 pixel sets associated with me being in the frame. So here it is again, boom. So, so I've recorded a bunch of these. So this is just spamming into a dictionary at this point. There's nothing, um, nothing different than normal Max. It's a little bit of a pain. I could show you the patch I have to I have to format the data properly, but otherwise, I just put a bunch of things in a dictionary, and yeah, I'll do the second one. I'll call me not being in there class zero. Okay, so oops, ah, that's what I did. So so I'm gonna call this. This is madness. Um, I'm gonna call this. No, no, you, Michael Gunn. Yeah, this is gonna be class zero. Did I get that? Are there class zeros down here? Yeah. So I recorded a bunch of I recorded a bunch of other examples of class zero. So I want zero when output looks like this. Um, and let's see how is sound going. I haven't tested sound very well here. Um, so I hit play. Where is sound going to? This is back to the streaming lecture. I need to send sound to what? Ah, yeah, voice meter, voice meter, or cable. Let's try voice meter. Sorry, so I, I need to work out my sound here a bit. But um, actually, you're going to see this. This should be starting to happen, right? Where um, I'm going to 
I'll, I'll get rid of sound for a second. I'm going to train this. So if I send it the word classify in the name of the dictionary, so this dictionary down here is called my data. I'm going to train it to do classifications on my data. So it's either going to decide I'm there or I'm not. And it's working. When I'm not there, it's a zero. And when I'm there, it's a one. So, so far, so good. Um, million dollar question, how do I get my audio working? Um, let me power up voice meter here for a second. Um, bah, 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 bah. And this could possibly be working. Options. I'm starting to hear an echo in my microphone. That's always a good sign. So audio on, and let's tell Skype that it cares about which snowball menu is the right snowball menu. Audio video settings, blah, blah, blah. Coming from voice meter. Are you still? Messages in the chat if we're not. Okay, and this one. Oh, you can hear me now. This one.
Uh, I would think. Yeah. Joe, just this one. Um, this is a good Okay, maybe this is me making sound. Yeah, yeah, I'm so I'm just, sorry. So that was a good experiment, um, a teachable moment, as they call it. Um, so anyway, I was making this patch, which at least visually you can see what it's doing is identifying whether if I'm here, it's got a one. If I'm not here, it's got a zero. And if I have my hands up, it has a two. So this is a quick and dirty classifier, a video tracking thing. It was driving a really awesome PWM synth, which, oh man, it's so... Um, uh, but anyway, I'm, so I'm working on polishing up this machine learning object. I'll, I'll finish up by just saying on the other side, so this is classification using the nearest neighbors, pretty simple. But that's the what can they do default algorithm, and it works really well. Um, and then on the other side, I can also do regression. So if I click regress, it takes a second to train. Now it's coming up intermediate values. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to roll out a nicely packaged, fairly simple machine learning algorithm that could give you the kind of um, machine learning interaction that you would have gotten used to using. Um, and yeah, I really that was an incredibly confusing um, presentation, but. I'm glad to answer any questions if anybody's heard anything I've actually said. Ah, ah. Thank you, and sorry. So that will be a, an HD back screen. I'm hearing tons of audio feedback at the moment from somebody. That's better. Oh, am I good to go?
Okay, uh, let's do this thing. All right, my name is Nick. I'm one of my claims to fame is probably that I'm the first Max user in the UK, going back to I think 1991, 92, and I had to order a copy of Max with its big black binder uh, on the States. I can't hear myself speaking. That's better. Whatever somebody just turned off there, that's perfect. Okay, so yeah, a bit of my, by myself. I'm yeah, software guy, artist, done a lot of collaborations. Let's just dial up the uh, the old website, which I'll drag down here. Just a, so essentially, it's a whole pile of music, uh, video, installation works. Um, yeah, going back through at least 20 years. Some of these are Max dependent, some are WebGL, there's all sorts of stuff in here. But I'll put a link to the website up uh, on the Hackspace form at some stage. Okay, let me just find a link to what I want to talk about. So I need that, and I need that. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about closure for or Node for Max. Closure being a programming language, which I'll show you in a bit of a while. Node being Node.js, the JavaScript engine, and Max being the Max we all uh, know and love. So why are we doing this? Why is this of interest to us? Well, the aims really are, we want to kind of augment Max with what I might call real programming languages, those languages which can do uh, control flow, they can do stuff functionally, they can manipulate data, they can talk to the outside world, and generally they tend to come with a good set of uh, libraries as well. And I found that you get a lot of power if you take something like Max with all its kind of graphical interfaces, its control flow, and kind of weld that, spot weld that to a, a real language that can kind of do all this old school computer science stuff and have the two running at the same time. So that's kind of where we come from. And I started working on this, I guess, way back in 1994 or so, something called Pyrite, which somebody might, some guys out there might have might recognized from, yeah, it's 25 years ago now. This ran on the Mac 68000s, so that's two processors ago, uh, if anybody is keeping score. And it was essentially a embedded programming language that ran inside Max. And it was kind of a bespoke mix of Lisp and Smalltalk, um, which may sound familiar because it's written by James McCartney, and this language then kind of went on to become a uh, super collider. So it was the very first super collider system before it could do audio that ran inside Max. And I spent uh, many happy hours writing step sequences and all the usual kind of stuff using this. And then the 68000 went away, and we were kind of a, a bit stuck. So the new hope kind of came along back around, I think, 2003, when uh, Tofu Lafata ported Java into Max. So you could write your Max code, you could write Java code, you could load Java classes, and the two could talk to each other. Um, if you like Java, that's great. If you don't like Java, it doesn't the Java runtime. Give support for a whole bunch of other dynamic languages as well. So I put a front end in there for something called Groovy. I then did something uh, front end for Python, which I used a lot for step sequences, for driving monomes, for doing all sorts of stuff. Adam Murray did a, a port of Ruby, so he moved JRuby into uh, JVM for Max. And at this stage, uh, I got talking to Sam Aron of uh, Sonic Pi fame, who was doing a closure for a lot of uh, live coding music. So I put the, the closure system into JVM for Max as well. And yeah, got quite a lot of use out of that. It was great because it meant you could evaluate things live. You could type in lines of Python or Ruby or Groovy or Clojure and evaluate them. So you could kind of live code in it. But it was a bit of a kind of a maintenance hassle because with Java, you've got to mess about with class paths, and you've got to make sure you can find all your class files. 
And also the licensing of Java got to be a real headache because you know, Oracle were in charge of it. So, so I got a good few years out of that, I think, but eventually just the sheer hassle of getting the JVM compiled so that it would actually run inside Max properly and ensure that it wasn't one that Oracle had stopped us being able to use and so on just became a real, real headache. So where did we go from there? Well, into JavaScript, which kind of started becoming flavor of the week. It's a god awful horrible language, but you know, it's one everybody's using. It's the language of the web. And there's a lot of support for it out there, a lot of interesting stuff going on. I think I guess this is about the time of Max 5, give or take, when these objects for Max called JS and JSUE turned up and they essentially embedded JavaScript and the JSUE variant meant that you could actually embed JavaScript and you could do graphics as well. So you could do vector graphics in 3D in a Max patcher and have JavaScript sitting behind the scenes. Downsides are it was and still is a very old version of JavaScript. So it's not really current and you can't kind of write the modern kind of JavaScript syntax, which we all know and love. Also, its performance was so-so because it didn't run at interrupt level, it didn't run overdrive, so you couldn't do very timing specific or very tight timing using it in Max, which was a, a bit of a drawback for all those step sequences. But I did a huge part of work in that. JavaScript is, there's a huge amount of stuff out there to turn other languages in, into it. So if you've got JavaScript, you can turn PureScript, TypeScript, CoffeeScript into it. So this JS object, I had uh, CoffeeScript going to that, and I had Closure compiling into it as well. So I could do Closure script into JS and JSUI objects, which was kind of fun. But yes, old version of JavaScript, so not terribly useful in the end. What is Closure script? It's a modern variant of Lisp for originally the JVM. So Clojure, which came out, I guess, a good 10 plus years ago, is a version of Lisp that runs directly on the JVM in the Java world, so you can call Java from it. And from that got built something called Clojure script, a compiler written in Clojure, which takes the Clojure language and turns it into JavaScript, so you can then run that inside uh, web browsers, or in our case, inside uh, Node.js. So where does that get us? Well, where that gets us is fast forward to a couple of years ago, and now Mac supports Node.js, which is the JavaScript runtime system. And that can now be embedded inside Max as well. So we're kind of off to the races again. We've now got a modern JavaScript we can use, and we can kind of bring on our, our tools to bear. Node.js is kind of like uh, Java for Max, but it's not actually loaded as a library which the JVS is wired into Max using web sockets. And it's fairly performant. It's not fully, fully real time, but it's pretty nippy. And you can kind of do things that require timing, uh, fairly sharp timing, and you can kind of get away with it. And Node.js in particular has tons of third party libraries. Anything you want to do to talk to the outside world, there'll be some node library for doing that. Um, which wasn't true of JS and JSUI. They were pretty much kind of sandboxed into the Max world only. And the support for something called the REPL. So that means that we can now essentially live code JavaScript, or sorry, live code closure script, and have that, those changes in the live coding be executed immediately and go straight into the, the Max world. So we've got a live coding environment that we can use inside Max. And that means you can play along with all those people using Tidal Cycles and Super Collider and everything else. A hat tip here to Charlie Roberts and Graham Wakefield for uh, Gibber, uh, Gibberwocky, which is an environment that ran inside a web browser. And that was a JavaScript live coding environment that then talked to Max through WebSockets and would let you live code step sequencing from the browser point of view. So that was kind of... Um, a model I used when I was building this stuff, although my JavaScript's actually inside Node rather than inside a browser, so it's not quite the same architecture, but it's a very similar kind of approach. 
And yeah, this got used in the wild. So I've got a project with uh, Shama Rahman, who plays sitar. And we had a gig in Berlin last year where I was doing live coding Max, which was hosting a whole bunch of uh, VSTs, VST effects. And Sharma was playing the uh, sitar into that. And uh, yes, much fun ensued. There's the uh, website. And I can put that up on the, uh, the forum. So yeah, that's kind of where we are, I think. Um, let me see if I can actually demo this thing. So just give me a second here, and I will dial up the environment. So I'll start with a relatively simple example. Let's make it a bit bigger. So I want, uh, let's see, I want that patch. Uh, There we go, let's pull it down there. Don't know how visible that is on the stream. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Not a huge amount here. There's a thing that's actually running the, uh, the Node.js. There's a dictionary here that's currently empty. And then there's a little window here that's actually debugging the state of the Node.js process and letting us see what's going on. So I need that. The other thing I need is some actual code. So let me dial it up here. If you've never seen this before, this is what it looks like. Just tons and tons of brackets. Uh, I'm not going to make this into a list tutorial. I just want to kind of show what we can do from the right hand side of my screen, which is my live coding environment, and the left hand side of the screen, which is uh, the Max environment. Right now, things aren't connected at all. So, firstly, I've got to actually uh, fire up. The server here. Uh, let's see what we want. I want. Uh, this thing. So the wheels start turning, and now I get a server which my Emacs is talking to, whose task is to take my bits of closure code and on the fly turn them into JavaScript and pipe them across into the Max world where they get executed. So there's process. Oh, that's not going to work. So I typed the wrong thing. Let me just stop that again. Okay, let's try that once more. We want that, and we want uh, we want that, and we want that. So at the top, we're seeing Clojure running at the moment. And it will then try and boot up into uh, Clojure script. Or it will if I get the Mac side running. So let's see if this works. There we go. And my mouse has died. Never mind. In the Max world, and now we're running a closure script to closure to JavaScript the layer on this side. So I can now start executing fairly random things. So let's just dial up the Max API. And now if I start running bits of code here, you should start seeing that dictionary will start getting populated with things. So here we are doing real actual honest to goodness live coding. We look at just the right hand side of the screen, but it's rather than actually doing super collider or anything like that, it's actually driving Max, and then Max is doing all the stuff that Max can do, including all the jitter stuff, all the audio stuff. So there's a simple demo. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close this one because I've got a slightly more interesting one here. So let's actually close that. Uh, let's tear that down. And let's see if I can open. Uh, where are we? That guy there. So that looks fairly similar. Let me find the appropriate uh, scratch file for that. Play with promises would be a good band name. Yes, it would. Dances with promises, maybe. So let me fire this thing up again. 
Right. Good time to think. We want a fig wheel server there again. And we want a So that's compiled all JavaScript is now waiting for a connection on the Mac side. So let's actually kick that off on there. Boom, there we go. And because I'm connected to a node here, I can actually type in real closure script, type in JavaScript, and get real results back, which is kind of nice. And let's do some more evaluating here. So this thing, this max patcher is just a matrix, which is what, 16 by 16, and we can just kind of uh, paint cells into it. What's that doing? Set zero, zero, one, one, one. That's not working. Why is that not working? That's kind of interesting. Well, I don't mind. Let's see if it recovers. Evaluate that. And that again. And that again. So let's see if anything happens in that. Oh, there we go. So we can send out straight you know, max messages through the closure script world into JavaScript, into Node.js, and back out again. So they come back to this bit of machinery here. Or we can do things like a bit of uh, code here to randomize uh, the first row of cells. And all we're doing is sending out a whole bunch of messages, which are to set cell, clear, and bang. Well, to make it more interesting, we can do things like we can map a function across that two-dimensional space, my matrix there from 1 to 15 and 1 to 15, across and down. So for example, if I map across a function which is gives me all zeros, I get nothing. A function that returns me for every position, one, zero, and zero, gets me a whole bunch of red. A function which, let's see, for every position returns me, gives me a red channel if the x and the y are the same, and gives me uh, nothing for green and blue. That gets me a diagonal. What about giving me a red channel if x is greater than y? And that gets me the top there. Let's put in a blue channel, maybe, let's see, wherever. Let's go blue, and we should get a vertical line. And there's all sorts of variations we can do here. We can make our green channel, for example, uh, let's divide x by 16. And that should give us a kind of a gradient effect. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not doing sound. That may be uh, something for uh, a future presentation, but that should hopefully give you some idea of how we can kind of bring the uh, functional programming live coding world into the world of Max and have them kind of play nicer together. So, yeah, thanks for listening. I guess I'm up for questions. Ah, stun silence. <laughs> Well, there's quite a few moving parts here. The Max API from Node.js is just documented inside uh, the usual Max help. Uh, there's not much there. You can receive messages, you can send messages, and you can drive dictionaries. That's kind of the, re the real steel here. You can actually do dictionary updates. That's kind of it. There's no real much stronger link into the Max world or the Max for Live world. Um, and then I've got this, this project is on GitHub. So you can see the code for bringing up a system that can turn ClojureScript into JavaScript, should you wish to go away and uh, spend six months of your life learning ClojureScript. Um, yeah, yeah, Node.js is fairly new, so there's not a huge amount to learn about it. Writing scripts for Node.script is pretty easy. There's only a, you know, like a one-page document for it. So that's not, a, uh, not really a problem at all. Hope that answers the question.
Great. So, uh, so thank you, thank you so much, Nick, for that. We will mm -hmm. go back to. Yeah, we'll just leave the, leave my links there. Uh, we'll go back to the present to the other presentation here, uh, where we can see everybody. We, we I'm not going to put the, the video feed again. I think um, it wasn't working that well before. Um, hopefully, everyone can join in and we can conclude. Um, so I want to thank all of the speakers today. It was uh, really fantastic to, to have you all and, and open this perspective and open also our first series of our seminars. Um, and so next, next week, Thursday at the same time, we will have Jim Simmons, who has created a VR environment for creating music. Um, the week after this, we'll have uh, Phil and Keynes and Milton Mimikidis um, about making music from data. On um, the 23rd, we'll have Andre Cabal presenting Granurize, a Max for Live a granular synthesizer, extremely sophisticated. And on the 30th of April, we'll have Rob Ramirez, uh, who's a lead uh, developer of Jitter. Uh, and uh, please contact us if you if you want to see some uh, some talks. If you want to participate um, yourself, we'll be very happy to um, to host you. Uh, apologies, Miss Milton, if I did not pronounce your name correctly. Um, so yeah, uh, Darwin, may I invite you to also uh, say a few closing words. why we have to make sure that we don't abandon them just because we've been wedged into our homes, right? This is a great opportunity to share and technical issues notwithstanding. I think everybody is already in a mood to say that we can get over the technical issues and we can find a way to get uh, better at this stuff. And so I'm looking forward to continuing this, this series. It's an incredible group of people, uh, JB, that you've put together. Very excited to hear more of these things in action. And I personally want to thank everybody that presented today. This is some very inspiring stuff. And it helps it helps me stay excited as well, which is uh, pretty key for me. So I want to thank you all for that. All right. Well, uh, so thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Valeria, JJ, Mike, Nick. And Darwin, it's been it's been a fantastic first one. Uh, I promise I will work hard to make the next uh, version of, of this on the technical side much better uh, and uh, reliable. But uh, in terms of content, it couldn't have gone better. So thank you, thank you so much, and see you next week. Bye, right, bye, everyone.